from homemade cures to concern about pets. The number of claims going viral on social media have been spreading almost as fast as COVID-19 itself. We're putting some of the myths to the test on Roundtable. Hello, I'm Robin Dwyer. Our knowledge of coronavirus is just weeks old and scientists are scrambling to learn more about it as the crisis develops. So perhaps it's understandable that there are some unusual claims out there that have been spreading online. Misconceptions about what can protect you from COVID-19 are becoming just as contagious as the virus itself. What we do know is that it's a new illness that can affect your lungs and airways. It first emerged in Wuhan, China, where the first cluster was reported to the World Health Organization on the 31st of December 2019. According to the National Health Service in the UK, the main symptoms include having a high temperature and a new continuous cough. However, claims about the coronavirus are being spread far and wide on social media. Some of them are about how people might avoid catching the virus, like wearing gloves when touching common surfaces like a lift button or door handles, or that everyone should wear a mask. These two claims are the most controversial, as experts differ on the issue, and there have been few guidelines from governments or the World Health Organization. Other claims have proven to be false, such as drinking more water, or that the virus is no more dangerous than the winter flu, or that it only affects the elderly. But with so many myths circulating online, how can we be sure of the best ways to stay healthy? So we're going to fact check some of these coronavirus claims with our experts today. And joining me from Bath in the UK is Dr. Bharat Pankania, who is a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. He has long experience in infectious disease management. From Stockholm in Sweden, we have Sumaya Sheikh, who's the founder and editor of the Alt News Science facts checking website. She also has a PhD in medicine. And then we have Rewat Deonandan, who is in Ottawa in Canada. He's an epidemiologist and professor at the University of Ottawa, specializing in global health. Thank you very much indeed for being with us on Roundtable today. So let me start uh, by putting this to you. It's one of the topics that has been discussed most, I would say, around coronavirus. Wearing gloves when touching common surfaces like elevator buttons and subway poles. Is that a good thing that we should all be doing, or is that a myth? Um, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions. What you are doing by wearing gloves is achieving nothing, because you are still in a uh, infected area, you're wearing gloves, and now your gloves have got all the contamination on it. So, Maya, what's your view? Are, should we be wearing gloves? Do they protect us enough? I think gloves alone don't actually protect you so much. You ha it has to be in combination with other things that you're doing. Um, uh, isolation is one of the biggest things or the key things that you could do to protect yourself. Um, not going close to people who may have coronavirus infections. Um, but if you do have to go outside only for a small period of time, you can wear gloves, you can touch things, and it's, there's a correct way to take out the gloves. Sometimes people actually don't know that and end up actually um, uh, contaminating their own hands and think that, okay, well, because, because I was clean, I was wearing gloves, my hands are protected. So it can actually add um, to, to an infection instead of um, saving you from one. So yes, that is, that is definitely a problem, but for a small period of time, if you just want to touch a couple of things very quickly, then they might be okay. Uh, but if you want to wear it for the longer time, uh, it's not advisable. I can see you shaking your head, Dr. Bancania. Yes, I, 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 I personally feel in this crisis time, it's better to keep things simple. And by keeping things simple, I feel you do what you're used to doing. Wash your hands instead of pretending that my gloves are helping me. It's better to say, I will wash frequently. Absolutely, because is that the danger that people are being lulled into a false sense of security? Oh, I have my gloves on, so I'm safe. And then they perhaps neglect their hand washing. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, as I said, it's a combination of everything. You've got to do all of the things. Gloves alone are not going to protect you. 
Um, so yes, I do agree with him, but at the same time, um, gloves can do things. I mean, we're not going to go into a facility without wearing gloves, right? So they do something, but for a longer period, they will increase your humidity um, and they will give you a false um, uh, insecurity, uh, security that you will be protected. So of course, it's not a good idea to keep it on forever. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I disagree with my fellow colleague. Um, there is no evidence, no empirical evidence that wearing gloves outside in the public is of any benefit whatsoever. So I'm very sorry to be disagreeing with you. Uh, uh, I hope you won't be cross with me. No, of course not. Can I add something to this? Um, when we're considering these technological interventions to help assuage the, uh, the spread of the virus, we also have to consider the behavioral component. So when gloves are used by clinical staff in a hospital, there is a mechanism there's a process. They're removed every time they encounter a new patient. Uh, a lay person using this technology, because gloves are a technology, will use them incorrectly. In fact, there's a very high chance they'll be spreading the virus to new surfaces over their body, over their, uh, um, their possessions, uh, to new surfaces. So the use of gloves may actually exacerbate the situation if not used in the appropriate way. Is there something that people should be doing, though, if they are touching things like elevator buttons and subway poles? Is it OK to touch these with bare hands? Or do we need to worry about that? Yes. It, you Listen, it is very important you carry on life as normal. What you have to do is remember this. Your hands get contaminated. You are handling things. Therefore, what you do is timetable washing hands. You could say to yourself every two hours, I'm going to mindfully wash my hands. That is much better than giving yourself false sense of relief or belief that my gloves are a better alternative. It's you carry on life as normal, introduce regular, periodic, timetabled hand washing. Well, let me move on to, then to another uh, topic that many people have discussed. It's wearing masks. Everyone should wear a mask. Yes or no? Well, again, there is n this is a cultural thing, if I may say. So in the Far East, wearing masks is uh, a culturally accepted, practiced, got used to thing. In the Western nations, and maybe in the Americas as well, we don't wear masks. And when you start doing something that you have not use, got used to before, as my colleague from Ottawa said, this is a new technology. You could do more mistakes and actually introduce uh, infection to your mouth, nose area, because you're handling that area more excessively. In other words, if you're used to it, you do. If you're not, you don't. However, masks in a clinical area are extremely useful, and that's where we use them. And we use them properly in a clinical setting. If I may, uh, there are so many factors when considering the masks. Um, we don't know yet how the virus is really transmitted. Is it droplet alone or is it aerosol? If it's aerosol, the masks start to make a little bit of sense. But the kinds of masks used by clinicians are fitted N95 masks, and things can't get into the sides. The kinds of masks used by the layperson tend to be surgical masks. They're openings on the sides. They're not, it's not complete coverage. In general, it seems to me it's a good idea if you have a respiratory condition, you can wear a mask to prevent spreading it to others. The evidence is not clear that wearing it yourself to protect yourself from others is the right thing to do quite yet. And as noted, it may actually give you a false sense of confidence. You may touch your face a lot more during the day when you're wearing a mask. On the other hand, on the other hand, it might be a behavioral nudge. If you're wearing a mask, it might remind you, hey, there's something out there in the environment I need to be careful about. So I go back and forth on this, and the science is still unclear, and I anticipate as more data comes in in the next couple of weeks about the method of transmission, the degree of aerosol nature, we'll get a better sense of how to advise people. Uh, having, having said that, though, um, still the masks that members of the public wear, even if it is aerosol spread, are not airtight. And therefore, in the middle of the crisis, how do we say, OK, now wearing a mask is a good idea? Because uh, you are either used to wearing a mask, you know how to use a mask, or you don't. So I've written a fact check on this, um, on wearing masks, and who should be wearing them and what sort. Um, 
yes, the people who wear masks in general public, they don't know how to put them on. They're the regular surgical masks. They're not tight-fitted. And more importantly, um, virus um, travels in the air in these aerosols, which are uh, clusters of virus mixed with water, for example. And um, there are studies that have been found um, that have shown that they stay in the air for up to about three or four hours after um, the person has, say, sneezed or cough. And they used this experimental technique um, um, in the lab to kind of replicate the way that the people would cough or sneeze and the virus would spread over. So um, if it's around three or four hours after, still in the air, then we're likely to catch an infection even though we've moved away from the place where the person has sneezed or coughed. Um, secondly, the virus can also spread from the eyes. So as I said, Gloves alone will not do anything. Uh, a mask alone, a badly fitted mask, may give you a false sense of protection, yes, but alone it would not do much. Your eyes are also vulnerable, and uh, if you have noticed, the healthcare workers also protect their eyes from this plastic sheet, and, um, they, and, and, and that's uh, very important. But at the same time, um, I don't suggest wearing the regular surgical mask, and I, I, and I agree that, that there's only so many masks um, that we can, we're going to have, and our healthcare workers are prioritized in wearing them. Um, but at the same time, we know that a lot of people can be asymptomatic as well, or could have just mild symptoms. And it's important for those people to cover their mouths while they're sneezing. So at least those droplets can just kind of get contained in whatever's in the front um, and not spread in the same way and, and linger on for three to four hours. Or um, you know, uh, if it's if it's been sneezed on on an object, then it can become a fomite. So and and if on on the surfaces, there re there's research that um, uh, these fomites can be contagious for up to um, uh, two to three days. For instance, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so at the same time, even if you wash your hands, um, say once in two hours, you're more likely to touch your face every now and again, and that can also lead to infection. So what, what is it that we should be doing? It's a collective of things. It's not just an individual mask, glove, etc. cetera. Um, if I may, the, the point about um, the eye transmission is well taken. And again, it comes down to whether or not aerosol transmission is actually happening to a large extent. It's not just uh, droplet transmission. And fomites are a real thing. Um, it's only relevant for the mask discussion if, in fact, people are licking windows, right? So fomites in general don't touch your face. I will say, though, that if we are not uh, performing proper physical distancing, if people are going to be close to you on a regular basis, then to me a mask starts to make some sense. That's when the droplet transmission starts to have a bit more meaning and, and the possibility of eye contamination becomes a real thing. But if we are pursuing appropriate physical distancing of one to two meters, um, then the mask becomes less important. I won't get mad at someone if I see them wearing a mask. I understand. And if we aren't short of masks for clinical purposes, then um, I think the, the good outweighs the bad, even though the bad is a real thing, this temptation to touch your face and to spread things further. So I'm going to equivocate as well, like everybody else. But if you push me to the wall, I will err on the side of, if it makes you feel better, wear the mask. OK, another claim to put to you all then. Pets can spread the virus. What do you make of that? There is no evidence for this. So there's a couple of, of cases of nasal swabs of dogs finding uh, viral shedding. But that's a case of a dog inhaling something in the environment and it landing on the mucous membranes. No evidence at all of the dog being infected. So this virus jumped a species barrier already from a bat to human, possibly via an amplifier species, possibly via the pangolin. Jumping a species barrier is a huge deal, and it's highly unlikely it's doing this multiple times. So um, dogs and cats and humans do share some diseases, but very, very few, and it's difficult to find one pathogen that can infect such different species. So this is not true in any, any measurable way. I can see some nodding, nodding heads. Do you both agree? Yes, and um, you know, to share with our viewers, I would also like to add that this is not only something that we agree with, uh, that it's unlikely, but we're keeping an open mind. So I do know my colleagues here in the United Kingdom are keeping a very watchful eye to test, to check, and to double check. But biologically, we feel it is highly unlikely. Yeah. Another thing that I'd like to add is what it is doing is that um, a lot of people can be insensitive towards their pets and abandon them or stray cats and 
um, uh, those uh, those who are not well taken care of. Uh, I think um, they can be even more isolated in this period. So so that's something to be watchful of. Um, you know, are, are we causing uh, insensitivity towards our pets uh, in this period? Okay, let me ask you about um, the, some suggested cures, which hasn't been proven. The anti-malaria drug chloroquine, there's a suggestion that that might help. What's your view on that? Well, there are research trials ongoing right now, and they have not reported, and it is good science to wait for the trials to report to show us efficacy, rather than to blindly muddy the water and say we are going for chloroquine or any other medication that has not been properly proven to work. I tend to agree with that sentiment. Um, we get reports from the field, particularly from Cuba and other countries where chloroquine has been widely used for this particular disease, and the case studies are encouraging. It isn't quite science. These aren't randomized controlled trials. They're not clinical trials. We can't make conclusions of any weight about whether or not this is an effective treatment. I do think, though, that we're in an emergency scenario, and we must keep an open mind. And if, um, as the trials are underway, the preliminary data can guide some clinical choice in emergency settings. So I am not as strict with the threshold for evidence-based medicine in times of pandemic emergency as I would be in other times, especially given the risk-reward ratio. When chloroquine is uh, applied with the appropriate medical oversight, it can be safe. If it's done you know, uh, willy-nilly, then it can be quite unsafe. Yeah, uh, I mean, the paper that got recently published uh, by a group in Marseille isn't advocating for chloroquine by itself, but uh, in combination with azithromycin, which is an antibacterial. I mean, everyone knows that um, this is a viral infection and an antibiotic might not actually do much. Um, but more importantly, so it was just published um, uh, in 2020, um, uh, and um, it, it had very a small sample size. Um, uh, I am aware that in other places, just Cuba, as my colleague mentioned, um, there has been some results. But this particular paper um, I have read recently doesn't show much uh, in terms of efficacy. Um, and the paper is also need, it needs to be taken with a pinch of uh, salt. Um, they've got other problems uh, with this group. Uh, there is um, uh, a, a group of people on, on the Internet who, who do fact-checking in in a way where they push uh, uh, journals to uh, check figures uh, if they've been plagiarized and things. And this particular group has been found uh, to do some of the statistical and figure-related, um, you know, fudging. Um, I'm not going to comment a, bit, a lot more on that, but uh, what this particular group who published, um, the first author is Colson, um, has uh, suggested the use of prophylactic chloroquine, which is far more dangerous than something that has been used under medical supervision. Um, and uh, uh, as opposed to that, there is a Chinese study um, led by Parola, um, uh, also recently published, which suggested there was no effect um, uh, if uh, hydroxychloroquine with, was given with um, azithromycin uh, for COVID-19. So there are these confounding studies, um, but obviously, uh, you know, we have we need to do more testing and, and whether the science is right. And the, and the third part of this is that uh, it does lead to cardiotoxicity um, and other problems if uh, taken uh, without the medical supervision and just saying out loud in public in the way um, Mr. Trump did and, uh, uh, and, and, and an Australian politician also tweeted the same. Um, it is very dangerous that people can take these medications by themselves, specifically when we talk about cardio, um, uh, cardiovascular problems. Well, when we first started hearing about uh, coronavirus, uh, many people said it was no more dangerous than winter flu. That's a myth, surely. Yes, it is. And um, it's, a, it's a, a big er erroneous myth because for any age group, any age group whatsoever, it is more severe disease causing, more infectious than the influenza virus. Furthermore, in the older age group and for people with coexisting medical conditions, it is a lot worse. So as soon as you hit 60 plus, your case fatality rate starts to rise up 
it rises up to about 3.6 based on Italian data. And then for 75 to 70 to 80 year olds, it goes up to 5.6. And then for 70 to 80 year olds, it goes up to about 8, 8.5%. So the case fatality rates in the older age group, plus people with coexisting medical conditions, is considerably higher uh, for coronavirus compared to influenza. And in any other age group, the severity of illness is much more than influenza. So we have to take it more seriously. This is, um, as the epidemiologist, this uh, is such an interesting question to me. And we have to keep in mind several things. First is that this is not the same species of pathogen. A coronavirus is not an influenza virus. There are, I think, six coronavirus species that are known to infect humans. And this one is brand new. So we have no immunity to it. I like to think of this in terms of three categories, infectivity, pathogenicity, and mortality. My colleague just talked about the mortality. This disease is significantly um, more likely to kill you if you get it, that's the case fatality rate, um, than the flu. It's far more infectious. So if you do have it, you're far more likely to pass it on to somebody. And it's more pathogenic, meaning if you're exposed to it, you're far more likely to get ill by it. And the rate of people becoming seriously ill is higher than you would find in the flu. Those three factors alone make this a much more serious concern. When you scale it up at the population level, this is why it is such an unbearable assault on economies and civilization at a certain level. So the flu we handle every year. And because our, our species has a long-term history with the flu, we've grown up together with it. We're almost biological partners. We kind of have some inbuilt immunity every year. This is brand new, and it's going to take some generations for our species to become more acclimated to it. So uh, a simple answer, this is not the flu. It's a lot more serious. Take us seriously. I totally agree with that. Um, I, I mean, on an average, the seasonal flu kills 0.1% um, um, of the people who become infected. I mean, the highest uh, people, highest number of people who got infected was, I think, somewhere around 1918, um, where there the, was about 2% uh, of the people who got infected. But this this uh, coronavirus, is this is just by far the, one of the most contagious um, uh, uh, you know, infections, viral infections that we've got. Um, so, and it, and it impacts a lot more people. So, so, but yeah, of course, this is this needs to be taken more seriously than the flu. And and we we've known the flu for such a long time. It was back then in 1918 when we saw these statistics. So uh, this is so new, so unpredictable, uh, the, and all sorts of misinformation has been going around it. And I think more importantly, um, as the WHO had put it, uh, we were fighting an infodemic. Uh, with flu, it wasn't quite the same either because you know it, it, it's been coming through the times when we didn't have social media in the same way as we have now, um, I'd like to take it further and I would call it a misinfodemic instead of an infodemic. So, so this is far more dangerous as well. Misinformation is causing a lot more harm to people um, on top of the uh, the precariousness of the, of the disease. Mm. So, so yes. Well, we I was, I, I wanted, sorry, I, I wanted to ask you about misinformation. There is clearly a lot of that going around. How do people make sense of what they can see? How can they find information they can trust? Just briefly. Um, well, you I'm, would go, for example, to your government websites. At least they are tried and trusted and recognized. You know, there is the WHO website. There is, in Europe, the ECDC website. There is the CCCDC website in the United States. So you would, your first port of call would be official government websites and not social media unverified. 100%. That's I, true. I, I, would, I would echo that. I'd also like to say to you know, my fellow scientists and, and clinicians, um, I think we've done a poor job of communicating with the public how this actually plays out and what the specifics are. So I hope that in the coming days and weeks, we will step up our game and be better communicators for the public. I agree with both of you. But at the same time, I disagree that the, the government website is the only place to look for credible information, at least not in every single country. I mean, for example, um, India, um, the first response to COVID-19, um, I think it was end of January, was uh, ad advocating for uh, non-evidence-based or uh, alternative treatments. And one of the front lines of that was homeopathy. It was a drug called Arsenicum Album 30. And this came out from the official health ministry website. Um, they do have a have an alternate ministry, uh, which is called Ayush, and it's a combination of 
every single alternative medicine that you can think of. Um, Ayush is for Ayurveda, yoga, um, Yunani, homeopathy, and Siddha, which is like another version of a naturopathy like medicine, but it's uh, indigenous to India. Um, so these these um, uh, treatments, are, they were not treatments, but they were uh, ways to handle um, COVID-19 symptomatically and prophylactically. So this, this was um, the first response uh, uh, to uh, or against COVID-19 or a threat of it, possible threat of it in India. Um, and uh, the, the biggest problem with that is that uh, they, they were advising people to take something like homeopathy, which, is, which has absolutely no science. Um, uh, and they would, they would want people to take this and, 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 and think that they could be protected from this. So Protect these, your sources, is that what you're saying? Don't believe everything you read, don't believe everything you hear. Thank you very much indeed for joining me on the programme, Dr. Bharat Pankania. Sumeya Sheikh and Rewat Dionandan. Many thanks. Thank you. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.